most people in the South live in economies centered directly on natural resources. So when globalization starts to change the economy, yeah. the first thing globalization does is create a new resource grab. But also, by pushing higher consumption of these items. So the greed of the corporations is based on creating con over consumption and consumerism on the part of citizens. This means the resource demand keeps increasing, but that resource demand can only be met by destroying the resources and ecosystems that support local communities. The second way in which globalization creates poverty is by destroying the production systems of local economies. Um, last year, 2010, we stopped a major mine which aimed at mining a sacred mountain of the tribals. The name of the mountain is Niamgiri, which means the mountain that upholds the sacred law. And the tribal said, if you destroy this mountain, you destroy our world. Now, this mountain is made of bauxite. Bauxite goes to make aluminium. The bauxite in the mountain provides the water, supports the forests that support the tribals. When the bauxite is taken away, not only is the cosmology destroyed, the water is destroyed, 32 streams would have dried, the agriculture is destroyed, the forestry is destroyed, and with it, the livelihoods and economy of local people, and they become poorer. Two examples. The first is, Globalization has led to a total takeover of seed in the cotton sector by Monsanto. Globalization forced over India's, mar India's market and said Ma Monsanto should have a right to sell. Monsanto started to sell GM cotton. The GM cotton price was 7,000% higher than the local cotton price. They created agreements with the seed companies totally control the seed supply and not allow seed companies to sell anything but the GM cotton. As a result of which, farmers are spending more money. The cotton itself is unreliable, it gets more pests, they have to spend more on pesticides, they're getting into debt, and debt is pushing farmers to suicides. 250,000 farmers have committed suicide in one and a half decade since globalization. Globalization of agriculture has meant uh, the combination of two very strange phenomena. One is $400 billion subsidies given to the agribusiness of rich countries and forcing the poor countries to dismantle their national borders. Coconut prices dropped from 10 rupees a nut to 2 rupees a nut because of soya dumping. 8 rupees were stolen from a poor Indian farmer. That's how poverty is created. The mechanism that is now arriving in Europe is the same as structural adjustment. But even where the IMF is not knocking at the door of European countries, banks are putting the pressure. Because the economy has shifted from a centering on nature and people to a centering on finance and banks. And they have become the rule makers for the economy. What is good for them is supposed to be good for society, even though the opposite is true. What's good for the banks is bad for society. And that structural adjustment forces Italy to shut down its universities, to privatize its schools, to attempt to privatize its water, which is why the Italian referendum is so important. So in everything, instead of activities supporting society, Activities are now supposed to generate profits for a handful of companies. But most importantly, the shift has to take place in our minds. We have been made to believe that a handful of banks, a handful of corporations, are, we have to be dependent on. That dependency, that slavery, It's the corporate structure that has created an assault on the earth that makes it 
look like the solution will come out of only individual choices. And while we have a duty to ourselves and to the earth to consume less and to be part of a sustainable system, we have that choice. But it doesn't rest only on individuals in a fragmented society. Yeah. And that is why the fate of the earth is in our collective hands. And, it, and collective hands means, A, we see ourselves as part of the earth. And then we are not individuals anymore, we are part of the earth community, we are connected. And as an con interconnected community, as an organized community, we have power. I think that is one of the most false ideas of our times. That the South wants growth because the poor want commodities. Yeah. The poor are fighting commodification. Um, the poor farmers are saying, we don't want commodification of agriculture. Mm -hmm. So the poorest are fighting commodification. The poorest are fighting growth and are in fact part of the regrowth movement even though they don't use the language. From 2002 to 2011, they have established a total monopoly in the cotton seed market. 95% of the seed sold in, cotton, in the cotton field is only Monsanto. The Monsanto tried last year to introduce a BT aubergine. Uh, we built a very strong movement. We forced the government to have public hearings. Public hearings were held in seven cities and the government was forced to put a moratorium. European citizens have been totally committed to keeping Europe GMO free. The lobbyists of Monsanto are very active in Brussels and that is why year in and year out, the European Commission tries to undo the bans and the moratoria. So in Europe, as in every other part of the world, the issue of GMOs or GMO free is an issue of dictatorship and corruption versus democracy and freedom. Europe as European Commission deliberately denies the risk. And that is because everyone sitting in the new authority that approves GMOs, which is crazy. Why should you have a new authority just for GMOs? You had the environmental authorities. You have the environmental commission part of the governance. And then suddenly they created the European Food Safety Authority, which is stacked with people from the biotech industry. So they're just doing their old job, approving. And that revolving door between the industry and uh, EFSA has been established again and again. We cannot have a world in which corporations are globalized, greed is globalized, grabbing is globalized, citizens are only local, conservation and protection is only local. It's an unequal contest. And so Navdanya International is founded on this recognition that citizens' responses must also be globally linked. We stay rooted locally, I will continue to do my work in India. The team here will do its work in Tuscany, but together we will work in harmony. The second reason why we have created Navdani International and why it is in Italy is I have for the last 10 years worked very closely with the region of Tuscany. Uh, the government created the International Commission on the Future of Food, which I was asked to chair. Unfortunately, because of the changes in government, this amazing team that has been created, you know, it was as if... So we, I was very disturbed. And I felt that the tremendous work that had been done by Artia, by the International Commission on the Future of Food, should continue. The second activity will be to continue the broken work of seed conservation protecting seed and protecting the custodian farmers. Uh, a third piece of the work, as I said, 
is about redefining our relationship to nature. And we are hoping to offer courses, like we do in Dehradun. In India, in Dehradun, at our school at Nardania, we offer short courses. Mm -hmm. And our school is connected to the Schumacher College in England. And these short courses include courses on Ghana. They include courses on sustainable agriculture. They include courses on water. Because we are in this turbulent time of what should be the human enterprise, will we be turned into mincemeat for the globalization machinery, or will each person stand free in dignity? Yeah.